Thank you all for coming today. This is a big day in the 44-year history of community legal services. Uh, my name is Doug Ferguson. I'm the director of CLS, and uh, I want to welcome you all to, uh, to Western Law. I want to say to members of the bench, members of the bar, and court staff that we at CLS are grateful for the kindness you have shown and the help you've given to our students over the years. In doing so, you've helped them become better lawyers and believers in the cause of access to justice. I also want to recognize Grace Gallant for her superb work in organizing today's opening ceremonies and this symposium. She did it all with a smile on her face and I'm very grateful to her. We're fortunate in Canada to have a democratic system of government. And there are two main characteristics of a strong democracy. The first is that laws are passed by a legislature elected by the people in a free and fair election. The second characteristic is the rule of law, with laws enforced or interpreted by independent courts, and the courts are accessible by all residents of our country. I think many of us involved in the legal system have recognized over the years that something is wrong. Too many people can't afford a lawyer. Legal aid cutbacks now mean that fewer people qualify for coverage. Courts have large backlogs. As a result, Canadians are beginning to sense that with the high cost of legal services, the courts are not accessible and they are not given a fair opportunity to be heard. This is eroding the faith of Canadians in the rule of law and by extension their faith in our democratic system. Chief Justice McLaughlin has said, there is no justice without access to justice. I suggest to you today that it is the duty, the duty of the legal profession to take action. And I'm sensing momentum is starting to build. The National Action Committee chaired by Justice Cromwell issued a report last fall. The Canadian Bar Association Access to Justice Committee's report came out in December, and I highly recommend to you that you have a read of that. You can find it on the, uh, at cba.org. You'll see a, a, a link there. And uh, the Law Society's Treasurer's Advisor Group has reported recently as well. And reports are essential, but the time for talking has passed. Now is the time to take action. Today we're going to hear about two of those reports from the CBA and the Law Society. And there are panels we'll be talking about the actions we need to undertake in law schools across Canada and secondly here in London. Our first keynote today is Fred Heaton, the president of the Canadian Bar Association. Fred is the Assistant General Counsel, Labour and Employment Law at Air Canada in Montreal. And he's the first in-house counsel to become president of the CBA. Prior to joining Air Canada, Fred worked in private practice in Montreal in labor, employment, human rights, privacy, and admin law, as well as civil litigation. And he also taught courses at the law faculty of the National University of Rwanda. I first met Fred last August in Saskatoon at the CBA Canadian Legal Conference and watched him in action a number of times, including this past weekend in Ottawa. What I like about him the most is that when he speaks French, I can understand most of what he says. <laughs> Uh, Fred has been the spark plug behind the CBA's Futures Initiative, which is examining the changes that are coming to the profession in the next several years. And make no mistake, big changes are coming to the practice of law. The breakup of Heenan Blakey is just the beginning. The CBA's Access, Access to Justice Committee, as I said, issued its groundbreaking report in December. And on the weekend in Ottawa, its, its vision was officially adopted by the CBA Council. And I think it's appropriate that the CBA is taking the lead on this issue. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the Canadian Bar Association, Fred Heaton. <laughs> and uh, in fact, a big thank you not only to, uh, to Doug for the invitation to be here, but also to the university because Doug uh, has given a lot of time to CBA in the last little while. And it's time we certainly appreciate because he brings to uh, two projects a great depth in experience, an awful lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, energy and passion, as I'm sure folks here are quite familiar with. Uh, Doug's working our, with our folks on access uh, and also working on the futures work that he mentioned, looking at the education side of things, 
which is why it's just wonderful to be here today because in this ceremony, this symposium, the opening of the new facilities is a great reminder that the two go hand in hand. Doug is helping address through this work, and, and uh, not just Doug, of course, it's a, it's a much broader team, but the team is helping not only to increase the level of access to justice in this community, but also giving students an exceptional opportunity to learn about what it means to practice and how to relate to your clients and how we might do things differently. I think it's a, a wonderful uh, example of, uh, of synergy, and I congratulate you on it, and I wish you another 40 and 140 years of, of great success here at, uh, at CLS. It's also exciting to be here speaking on the topic of access today because I agree with Doug that there is some momentum out there. We may be, in fact, even at a tipping point right now. We're starting for the first time in a long time to see the signs that would suggest that there may be an interest in the broader political di discourse out there to do something about access to justice. If you take a look at the clippings that you might find online from the last provincial election in British Columbia, for example, if you take a look at what the legal community led by the CBA did in Newfoundland after the last provincial budget, there are examples of where the governments of this country have had to start to respond to what we feel is very much a crisis in, um, in the state of the legal system because of the problem of access. The solution I'm going to suggest, and, and to try to sort of situate today's event a bit, the solution really lies, though, with each and every one of us. The report that Doug referenced that we adopted as official CBA policy on the weekend calls on each and every one of us to see what we can do in our practices to improve access to the legal system. And if an in-house counsel from one of Canada's largest corporations can stand in front of you and say, I think we all should do this, and in fact, I am doing this with my team, I think everybody in the room here can find some way to contribute to helping solve that problem. It's one that will require many different stakeholders. It's going to be one that's going to take some time, but it's not going to happen unless each one of us puts our shoulder to the stone and helps move it forward. So for the students here, I hope that you'll in particular hear that call and that you'll take the time to get familiar with the reports Doug has mentioned because you have the longest runway ahead of you in terms of what we might do uh, in term for access and, uh, and, and delivering legal services differently, whether that's for those who today would come to the clinic or those who can pay for a lawyer to handle their, their particular problems. Let me backtrack a little bit and share with you some of the statistics that have troubled us, some of the, the images that have come to mind at the CBA when we've been looking at this question over the last few years. As Doug mentions, we, we produced a report. It took us about two years, really, to complete the work on that report. But as you talk to the people who are most profoundly affected by the problem of access to justice, their comments are quite startling. And that gets reflected, I think, in uh, a number of very disturbing ways. When you talk to people about uh, their experiences with the legal system, you find people saying things like, um, I was marginalized. You find people saying things like, it didn't solve my problem. I couldn't find myself or my way through the whole of the process. We spoke to a single mother in Moncton, you know, who was telling us that she's just felt incapacitated was her word because she didn't know where to start dealing with the kinds of issues that had came from a, a court order that she was trying to get enforced. You would think that would be a fairly straightforward thing. She actually got to the point where she had the order, but now actually needed to get it enforced. There was one woman from Saskatoon who said that navigating the system was so complicated that she says, this was her quote, I guess all you can do is pray. Now there may be a role for that, but if that's all you've got to lean on, uh, you're in a pretty dire situation. The one that really jumped off the page for me though was somebody who said that the legal system left him feeling as if he'd been silenced. When I went to law school, Doug, I don't know if you still teach a few phrases in Latin even, but we learned a bit of Latin here and there. And Audi alterum partum was one that certainly stuck with me. And if in a system designed to hear people, somebody is being silenced, I think we have a crisis that's emerging in the system. That crisis has been uh, quantified by some people. There are, as you may know, studies out there that speak to how different jurisdictions are dealing with questions around access. And it does not paint, rather, a very pretty picture of Canada. Of 12 countries surveyed in North America and Western Europe, Europe in 2011, Canada ranked ninth. 
In 2012, a year later, a survey of high-income countries around the world showed us to be 13 out of 29. Slightly better, but 13 is still an awfully long way from the top. And when it comes to access to legal aid, on, in a survey that looked at 66 countries around the world, Canada finished 54th. The G20 is meeting. We're part of the G20, but we're ranking at these kinds of numbers, 54th. If you take that very personal side of things, those stories that I was telling you about, you add to it the statistics, I think we have very much a crisis on our hands. And the consequences of that crisis concern me a great deal. They concern me both as a lawyer and thinking about the kinds of obligations I have, but also wearing my hat as CBA president. Because I do think, as Justice McLaughlin has reminded us, there's a very direct link between things like access to justice and some of those cornerstones of what it means to live in a democracy. And if people don't feel like those cornerstones are there for them when they need them, they're going to take things into their own hands. I'm not suggesting riots in the streets and whatnot. I'm not suggesting that you know, we're all going to end up in fistfights over things. But if we're not playing that role we're supposed to, people are going to find less than optimal solutions to their problems. I happen to think that questions that involve fairness and justice are complicated a lot of the time. That's why it takes three years of university study before you go off to become a lawyer. Barack Obama seems to disagree with me on that one, and I'll discuss it with him next time we have coffee. But these questions have, uh, have left philosophers and jurists struggling for centuries. There's a piece of this that's very complicated, that's for sure. But we must find ways to make the whole process of solving those problems easier to deal with. Because if we don't, people will turn to those who don't have that training to solve their problems. And some of the other work that we're doing, we've looked at examples where other service providers have started to provide what might amount to legal services. I'll leave that to the folks from the Law Society who are here with us today to, um, to comment on how we might crack down on some of that, and, and we should sometimes. My interest is really, what are those people doing that resonates with people? How is it that they've made their services more accessible to them? And why are people not coming to lawyers but going around us and getting these problems solved otherwise? If we don't find better ways to serve the Canadians who count on us, they're going to continue to find ways around this system. And if that happens, I think we could find ourselves with the kind of problem that our Chief Justice in Quebec mentioned but about nine months ago now. And here you are, Doug. He spoke of a décrochage. And I've yet to actually find the English word that works for that, but I, the best I've come up with is an uncoupling. And he was speaking in that context about the student protests a couple of years ago now in Quebec. There was a, a big uprising around uh, tuition that had been frozen for many years. The government was proposing to uh, unfreeze the tuition rates. And the students took to the streets, but they also took to the campuses and started shutting down, effectively, a number of buildings on campuses across the, uh, across the province. And the chief started issuing injunctions about this that went entirely ignored. He said that's another tipping point that could be very dangerous. These are people who are in school who should be learning things about the legal system and about history and about how our society works, who had a complete disregard for the legal system. Part of the problem to this solution is cost. When we went out and spoke with people, there are absolutely elements of cost that are part of the, the solution. But I think the problem can also be situated in another framework which says we need to resonate with pe those people. We need to relate to them. We need to be involved in their lives. And if we're not, they are, as I said, simply going to sidestep us. So what are we doing about it? Well, the CBA, again, as Doug mentioned, we just issued what I think is a rather groundbreaking report. It has a lot in common with the report that Justice Cromwell's committee produced. And in fact, that shouldn't be a surprise. We worked very closely with Justice Cromwell and his, his committee. That reflects our conviction that we need to collaborate among the community, the legal community in Canada, to make some progress on this. We have for many years, each of us in various ways, the law societies, the CBAs, the law schools, lawyers themselves, other groups of lawyers, other groups who work with lawyers and also work with the marginalized members of our society, we've all been pushing on different parts of this big rock we're trying to get up the hill. And so one of the things we've called for is everybody to get in the same place behind the rock and let's all push in the same direction for a while. See if we can't actually make some progress. So we worked with Justice Cromwell's committee and we'll continue to do so and we, we look forward to the opportunity to, uh, to build on the momentum that he helped set in motion. One of the things we did th with this report though that I think is very important is we started by speaking to those 
who were using the legal system. This was not a report by lawyers and for lawyers about lawyers. We went out and gathered those voices I mentioned a few moments ago by speaking to the most marginalized in society and those who, um, who work with them. And what we heard back, as I mentioned, had to do with cost, but it also had to do with literacy and language barriers. It had to deal with various kinds of disabilities, both physical and mental, that make it difficult to deal with the legal system. It deals with discrimination, which remains a problem that many people encounter on a daily basis in Canada. The committee took all of that, looked at the data they could gather about the state of the legal uh, system in Canada, and identified four barriers that they think we need to tackle as a priority. The first is a lack of public profile on this issue. So an event like today is a wonderful opportunity to start addressing some of that. They mentioned, as I mentioned a moment ago, a lack of coordination between all the people who are involved in solving this problem. But two other things, I think, popped out of this that are very important and probably actually are the kinds of things that a clinic like the one we're celebrating today could help us with. We need to be able to measure the change that we're making on this front. We need to be able to say, here is how much progress we've made in reaching the kinds of objectives we set for ourselves. A number of us, the treasurer included, were in Paris earlier this year, I guess late last year now, for the opening of the courts. If ever you have the opportunity, it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful affair. In, among, in those grand buildings that dominate central Paris. But I was standing on the street in front of the Law Society offices and I looked across to the courthouse. I don't know, Tom, if you had a moment to do this. It's this beautiful building, as, as you would imagine a European capital would have. The big marble columns out front. You see through the windows the gold chandeliers and the heavy curtains hanging and all the trim in the rooms. And I thought about Moostra, Saskatchewan. I thought about Moostra, Saskatchewan because the roof just caved in on the courthouse. Right? At one point, we were able to build buildings like that because justice was so important. Today, we can't fix the leaky roofs and we can't properly run the wires so everybody could use technology. Somehow, we lost the thread along the way. And I think the way to get it back is to be able to speak the language of those who make these decisions. And they are talking about targets and about metrics and how well are you doing or how far are you sliding. And we need to be able to engage in that conversation. So we need ways to measure the change that we're going to try to accomplish here. And then we need better knowledge about what's actually working and understand when we make progress, why did we make that progress? What were the drivers that brought that about so that we can replicate it elsewhere? The report did take another step though and started to articulate where it saw us going. It started to articulate those solutions and it did so using that very same language I just spoke of by speaking about objectives. It set out 31 of them. And Doug's offered me two hours this afternoon, so I'd like to take you through each and every one of them. <laughs> I think it says a lot that you need 31 objectives to solve this problem. Um, but they are in our report, and it's available online, and I will let you, uh, let you read that at your leisure rather than taking you through it today. But let's start by asking ourselves, what are they trying to accomplish, all of them together? And we asked the committee to give us a nice definition of what it means when we speak about access to justice. And this is what they gave us back, and I think it's a very good stab at trying to articulate what can sometimes be a very fuzzy concept. Our committee says that an accessible justice system is one that leaves no one behind. It is equally accessible to all, regardless of means, capacity, or social situation. It is a people-centered, empowering, preventative, and personalized system. It provides choices and it evolves over time. And it is meaningful because access can mean different things to different people. Let's sort of break those out a little bit. First, it needs to be focused on people's needs. We need to think about how people are dealing with other things in their lives. As I said at the outset, we need to resonate. We need to be relevant with them. We need to ask ourselves not how should the courthouse best be built for the lawyers and judges, but how should the courthouse best be built for the people it's there to serve? And maybe we could even ask ourselves, is court a place or a service? And if your answer is that it's a service, I think we can start opening up a whole host of other options in terms of how legal services are accessed in the country. Maybe they don't need to be in those glorious buildings that I would have a great time wearing my robes trudging about in Paris. But that's really about me feeling good at the end of the day. It's not necessarily so helpful for somebody in the outskirts of Paris who faces a long commute to get into central Paris with all the headaches and all the childcare 
uh, complications that that brings with it and the time off work and so on and so on. Maybe we should be delivering these things in different places. An accessible system, they said, needs to build on people's capacity to participate. That, I think, reflects a change out there that people expect everybody they deal with to take their input today. Doug's heard me talk about this in the context of the future stuff, but we can't forget just how profound technology has changed our lives. It seems like a trivial example, but I think it's very telling. If you were to pick up your phone right now and order a Domino's pizza, you could track on that very same phone how that order is being received, when the pizza's on the counter getting ready, when the pizza's in the oven, when the pizza's in the car, and when the pizza's at the door. You don't need to prepare your factum that way. I'm not suggesting that. But that's what people are getting accustomed to, and we need to find ways to engage with that. They expect that of us. And that's going to be a little disruptive, but I think it's very essential to resonating with them. We need to start preventing problems. Richard Susskind always speaks about, is it better to build a fence at the top of the cliff or make sure there's an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff? We need to be getting on with the fences out there. That too is something people are expecting. Another s s example that again may seem somewhat trivial, but your dentist will tell you to come in every six months. Not because they want to drill another hole in your tooth every six months. They actually want to stop drilling the holes in your teeth every six months. We need people to be engaging with us regularly and in ways that we can help identify problems before they emerge. The definition talks about several paths to justice. And that's because everybody's problem has its own little twists and turns to it. And maybe it's going to involve working with some other professionals along the way. And we do need to account for the fact that, oh, a social worker's life doesn't unfold like a lawyer's life does. We need to think about how people come through the system and how do we get to a solution that actually solves their problem in its entirety. As opposed to the judges who, some of them, who was judges in New York, were saying they've become society's emergency room. The last place you end up is the courtroom and the judge, poorly equipped to deal with much, much of anything in front of them, has to try to find a solution. We need to make sure those solutions are tailored to people's needs and we need to finally be very innovative about how we do it. We need to constantly be looking for other ways to tackle people's problems. If you take a moment to read the report, and I should say there are actually two reports. Being lawyers, we had to have a very extensive and thorough and few hundred page long report with nice footnotes and whatnot at the end. Makes all the lawyers feel nice. There's probably some Latin in there too. Um, we also have a 31 page summary report. Or no, ours was 31 page. I'll look. There's a summary report in any event with the 31 recommendations in it. A much shorter version of it. If you only have time, that one is, is available as well. What's great about it is it makes it accessible not only for lawyers, we stripped out the Latin and the footnotes, they actually produced a map of how you would get through this. It looks a little like a subway map from a large urban center. It's got all these colored lines all over the place that bring it all together in one central place at the end of it. And it speaks about a bridge and the different elements that are going to go into getting us to where we need to be, about building public engagement to try to make the case for change about uh, building collaborative and uh, uh, mechanisms of delivering the uh, services differently. And I think at this point, if you take the time to get even that far into the report, every one of the students here today and every one of the students in this clinic ought to be able to hear things that sound very familiar and I hope will inspire them to actually pick up the challenge of looking for ways to bring the rest of the report to life. The, um, there were four specific recommendations, if you make it all the way through the report, that pertain to law school, so I thought I'd just comment briefly on those today as well. The first one was that we hope that by 2030, and here we are, we're talking about objectives, so we put a timeline to them. 2030 sounds like a long way away. It's only about 16 years down the road. If you think 16 years back where we were and all the change that's happened, we have better get at it already, I think. But by 2030, the committee is hoping that there will be at least three Canadian law schools that have established centers of excellence for access to justice research. They hope that these uh, centers will be the kind of place that can help find those metrics I was talking about, find the ways to measure the progress that we're making. And I was going to suggest to Doug that maybe that could be your next office with a window. Take over another floor of the library and come up with a center of excellence is that again by 2030, substantial experiential learning is a requirement for all law students. Your way to the races. This, has been at the, this university has been at the forefront of this and can really serve as a, a model uh, for that approach to teaching right across the country and that is very much, I'll tell you right now, I'm not sure if we mentioned to you at the time, but that's exactly why we wanted Doug to be on our team looking at the future of legal education. 
Third is that by 2020, much closer in time, that all students graduating from law faculties have at least a basic understanding of the issues relating to access to justice. That's part of making sure this remains something that every one of us do in our careers uh, and throughout our careers as lawyers. The fourth objective is that by 2020, all law schools in Canada have at least one student clinic. So again, we're preaching to uh, those who already are con uh, convinced of the wisdom of that, but um, something that doesn't yet exist in other law faculties across the country, and we're certainly keen to help them get there. Now, one of the issues that does come up about access to justice and legal education is the cost of a legal education today. And so we've uh, taken a look because uh, that can have a consequence just a few years down the road as people have to start making choices about where they're going to work, which communities they're going to serve, where do they think they can start paying off those student loans best. And I think that's going to remain a challenge for us on the access front because we want to make sure people are able to take on uh, the kind of work that's going to need to be taken on to achieve the results we're looking for. It also has a related challenge at the front end of law school about who's getting in and who might relate to some of those people who really need our help when you talk about access to justice. So let me just say uh, in wrapping it up that the futures work that I mentioned earlier very much dovetails with the report I've just spoken about today. The CBA commissioned these two projects to unfold at roughly the same time. The access piece focusing on that larger problem of how do we design a system and create the system that will make access a reality across the country. That solution has a lot to do with lawyers, but it also has a lot to do with many other stakeholders out there. But we said that's not enough. Lawyers need to quite deliberately do their part as well. And so the work that we're doing on the future of the legal profession is designed to look at how we can deliver legal services differently. That has a couple of different elements to it, but one of them is absolutely the access point, because the more we can bring down the cost of legal services, the more we'll help access. So these two groups are working very closely together. Uh, the futures mandate, of course, goes beyond access and, and deals with the whole of the market for legal services. But the further we dig into it, the more the, the answers to these problems seem more and more similar to me. It brings me back to the point about relevance. People are quite happy. Uh, I was speaking to an in-house counsel in, in Calgary a couple weeks ago. He works for one of the large oil companies. They're about to set up a new affiliate to do some more exploration out in Alberta somewhere. And one of the accounting firms was hired to deliver a report on how to set up this affiliate and quite deliberately took the time to say there would be no need for in-house counsel. Really? <laughs> All the environmental side of this, the financing side of this, the operational side of this. We need to find ways to plug in so people understand the value. And in doing so, I'm convinced that we're going to find ways to do it cheaper by using technology, by working better with other professionals who can deliver the services that we don't necessarily need to deliver. Doug's heard this many times, but I'll close with this one last story for you, which is my dentist. And the students who came to see us earlier today could probably already tell you this too, and I see some of them grinning, grinning already. But think about how a dentist delivers services these days. Somebody greets you at the door, takes care of the paperwork, gets you set up comfortably in that rather uncomfortable chair with the bright light in your face. You spend most of the time with your hygienist. They do the cleaning, the x-rays tell you what's working, what's not working, and by the way, are trained to know when there's a red flag. When to go and get that dentist to come in because there's a serious problem. Then, you spend a few minutes with the dentist who does the quality assurance at that point, just making sure the whole process worked because, of course, the dentist has been in the next room dealing with something far more complicated than a regular cleaning. And then somebody takes care of filing the paperwork after you're done and make sure the insurance claim is done and whatnot. Now, my dentist, I've had to tell her, I feel bad, but I'm talking about you all over the country. And she finds this quite amusing. But I think there's really something to learn there because the dentists used to do all that themselves. And why did it change? Because the cost structure had to change. Because when dental insurance became a common benefit of employment, not for many of the people we're thinking about in the access world, but for many others, the insurance company said, forget it, we're not paying a different price for a cleaning throughout the city of London, much less the country of Canada. And they negotiated set rates for all of the tasks. Well, set with a, a rate that you can't push up. Is this sounding familiar to anybody in private practice? <laughs> set with a, with a rate you can't push up any higher. How do you make more profit? You bring the cost down. You just brought the cost down. Now we can actually start to deliver things more efficiently. They broke it into a process, brought other people in, trained them to watch out for the red flags. 
And now we've actually brought down the cost of that cleaning, which is the kind of thing that I think we need to think about when we're thinking about legal services. And let me leave you with this. I think we have to think about it because if we don't, we're going to be failing those who count on, on the, the government of Canada, count on their fellow citizens the most. Those who most need our help will be those who we fail if we don't actually take on this challenge and succeed. So I'd be delighted to take some questions on this. I'm around for a little bit of the afternoon uh, and afterwards by email. And thank you very much, Doug, for involving me in this and the opportunity to, uh, to participate in the symposium. That's great. Thank you. The, the room is uh, mic'd for sound, so if you have some questions, you can just uh, ask your questions from your, from your seat. So any questions for Fred? Well, you wowed them. <laughs> oh, there. There we go. Ken? Uh, yeah, Ken Bouchon is a local lawyer here in town. One of the, I mean, maybe some of the panel members are going to touch on this, but one of, one of the issues that I see that affects access um, partially is the increasing complexity of the procedural requirements in the legal system. I've been a lawyer for 17 years as of today or yesterday or something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I used to do general litigation and I've seen the complexity of, of what I have to do, which, which increases the cost of my client, have, I, I'd like to say it's doubled in the last 17 years. That's not a, a proper metric, but it's become much more difficult. When people have to represent themselves, or substantially represent themselves, there's a great difficulty in trying to describe them how to do all these procedural things. You need to have this type of margin, this color of back page, and all this sort of stuff. And, and you know, law itself is really concerned with interpreting the law, making persuasive arguments for case law, you know, all those sort of things, which hopefully the law students are doing. And, uh, so is, has there been any sort of consideration in your reports or about these sort of procedural complexity issues? Absolutely. Um, and that, that touches on a few things. I mean, you, you can think about the different colored backs. I remember doing that too, right? It, it, and, um, and glad that somebody does it for me now today. But back to my, who's the system designed for? Is that for the client or is that for the lawyer and the judge with the different colored backs? These kinds of things, you know, or it can be some small things. And some small things can make a very big difference along the way. Um, but where is the service out there for the self rep who wants to do it on their own? I prefer it to be that as opposed to has to do it on their own, so we'll take the happy case for a moment. But that could be a service that a paralegal could be offering, or maybe even somebody who's not even a regulated para. I mean, at the end of the printing shop who just knows what they're doing, right? To offer that up. Yeah, we'll make sure you get the paperwork right. The other th part of your question, though, I think, is why so much of the paper burden and why so much uh, complexity to the whole system? Uh, that's something that I think we also need to be taking a very serious look at. When I speak of having a number of stakeholders to this solution, one of them is going to be the courts and then who funds the courts to try to get us to a place where technology can start to replace a lot of that and make it move a lot faster. I'm quite troubled by a move out in BC that you, you may have heard of where they're setting up a new civil tribunal where from the get-go they've excluded lawyers as if it was the lawyers who are the problem. Anybody who's dealt with a self-represented litigant all the way through to trial will know Exactly. It's the unfamiliarity with the rules that tends to bog the whole thing down. The lawyers are actually a source of efficiency. It's the overall system. We need to give them the system to let them actually do that. So it's certainly on our radar screen. Unfortunately, it's one of those ones that I can't change myself. In fact, our president at Air Canada is also a lawyer, and uh, he likes to remind me that he's the kind of president that actually gets to tell people what to do. <laughs> All the CBA can do is ask people to do things. But um, that's the kind of thing that we are certainly raising when we meet with ministers of justice across the country, where the chiefs are certainly very intrigued and supportive of it. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be absolutely central to making the system work uh, more efficiently. For one more, Denise. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for coming. Uh, that was a great talk. I was wondering if you feel like maybe there might be a, sorry, I'll stand. If, if you feel like there might be some tension within the industry about access to justice, because I, I feel like we hear a lot about uh, access to justice in the Canadian legal industry, but <coughs> there are, and your dentist example could be used to certainly explain why there would be some motivators for lawyers not to want there to be increased access. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to some of those more silent forces if you feel like there's a tension there, are we going to be able to get over it? Because certainly people, all, I think lots of law students get into it, um, wanting there to be more access to justice. And so I'm just wondering how you navigate those tensions. And if it's been a, a, the CBA report is just awesome. 
Uh, how'd you get through it? How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. Two minutes. All right, hang on to your two, because we would say in Quebec, here it comes. Um, I don't sense much of a tension in terms of the profession and within the profession. Where I find, um, where I find the profession struggling, I think is how I would frame it, are lawyers who are saying, I understand the imperative about access. I went to a Canadian law school or I've had my credentials recognized. I get the system. I know why it's important. Thank you. I understand that my clients want more of me. They just don't quite know how to grab onto it and do it and do it in a way that still lets them pay the mortgage because you don't want lawyers ending up being the ones who are you know, looking for access themselves. So what we're hoping to do, and this is, uh, it overlaps with both projects, is to help show lawyers these are the other ways to practice that can open some of those doors to parts of, uh, on the future side, we speak of the market for legal services that are underserved and unserved today, which if you're an entrepreneur, that's what you're looking for. There's actually a way to bring some of these things together. Now, there will always be a piece of it that's going to depend on legal aid, and legal aid absolutely has to be properly funded and whatnot. But as you move away from that, I, I don't so much sense a tension as a bit of a bewilderment and a struggling to, to understand how do I get into that and, uh, and still be able to, to make a living. I'm convinced personally, and I'm getting ahead of the teams who have their uh, recommendations due to me very soon. We have dug under the gun on that because uh, we've got to deliver our other report in, in August. I think there's an awful lot of opportunity there. I, d I don't see a, a, a tension or a conflict between these two things. Lawyers can do just fine and actually do a much better job of serving everybody. Close Thanks to two? My pleasure. Today will be moderated by our, our associate dean of Western Law, Erica Chamberlain, and it'll be addressing what law schools can do to address and promote access to justice. And you, as you can see, we have some very distinguished panelists. Uh, Chris Bentley, the uh, executive director of the new law practice program that will be uh, an alternative to articling at Ryerson University. Uh, Margaret Capes, review counsel at Community Legal Services. Uh, Pascal Daniel, le président de uh, l'Association du Barreau de l'Ontario. Uh, Nikki Gershbain, the national director of Pro Bono Students Canada. Michael Lerner, uh, who I think all of us know, uh, who's also a bencher of the Law Society of Upper Canada. And uh, my major funder, Bob Ward, the CEO of Legal Aid Ontario. And Erica, it's all yours. ...to play a, play a role in this really important day in the life of Western law. And congratulations uh, to you for the new clinic space and for all the great work that you and your staff and students do here at Western Law. It's a real uh, source of pride for us here. Uh, so I've asked our panelists today to give us each to each give us a very brief opening statement um, on our topic of what what should be the role of law schools in promoting access to justice, and then uh, once they're finished, we can open it up and, and have some discussion after that. So I'm just going to arbitrarily start with Chris and, and make our way down. So. Well, thank you very much. Great to be back at Western, where I taught for ten years part time while I practiced full time criminal law. Uh, great to be here in London. Uh, delighted, Doug, and all those responsible that we've, you've opened up a brand new clinic and continuing 44 years of excellence in providing access to justice here in London. And, and Fred, thanks very much for the CBA and the OBA's leadership on these enormously important issues. I want law schools to be more involved in access to justice because this is where you think the tough things. This is where you think about what the law should be and whether the legal principles that you establish are actually going to be carried out in practice. But for as long as I can remember, there has been a divide between when we teach and when we practice. And it's not healthy for either. For as long as I've, I've been in practice, been a law student, there's been this reticence about bringing the issue of how the principles are actually applied in practice into the law school. There shouldn't be. Let me join the CBA reports directly. We either reform the system ourselves or it will be reformed for us. I, I would be delighted if there was a debate in law school 
about whether the BC initiative was appropriate or not. I'm happy to take the position that the BC initiative and the eBay initiative are absolutely right. They're marvelous. Well, because the alternative is a year or two years in small claims court. They're going to give you an answer to a dispute. But let's have the debate. We're better to have it than here. Let's inform decision making by governments, by the leaders, by those in control of the court system, the judges and senior members of the bar. Why ever would a law school want to give up that essential part of leadership? It wouldn't. You are the experts in research. You're the experts in challenging the unchallengeable. This is where it should start. We shouldn't be asking, what role should you be playing? We should actually be having a discussion about your latest research. I don't think we have till 2030. The civil system of justice will look fundamentally different in five years because it is not affordable for middle-income Canadians. And you know, I've been involved in access to justice uh, issues as a criminal defense lawyer for decades. And it used to be you were talking about the poorest Canadians, marginalized Canadians. It's not the issue anymore. And those tangentially connected to politics will know that when middle-income Canadians get upset, things change. We're in control at the moment. We have the opportunity to lead the change. We don't have 16 years to make the change. It is not complicated. It is not necessarily expensive. It is only a willingness to see to see where we want to end up. And I'll just finish my short intro with this. Every other service business, and we serve the people. We are a profession that serves. They have people involved in it who are experts in the most modern delivery systems for service industries. They have that training. We are the only one that doesn't ask those who direct the system, who design the system, who manage the system. We're the only one that allows people with no training in the most modern, lean business systems, we allow them to run it. That, that is the root of access to justice for all Ontarians. Where does it start? Here, as soon as possible, Western should be a center of excellence starting today. So, by way of background, I practice law, or used to before becoming president of the Ontario Bar Association in Point Edward, which some of you might know is Sarnia, about 100 kilometers from here. I've practiced in a small firm. I've also trained in a large firm and practice in Alberta. In my days, when I went to law school more than 25 years ago, um, we had something called Law Line, where we, I provided the legal information. Well, those days are gone. People access information now on the Internet. They don't need this. We don't, we, we didn't, I didn't have access to a course that would provide me exper experiential learning like you do here. And one of the questions is, what are the law schools are doing? This is fabulous. When I see that you can do, you can get advice on wills, you can get advice on, on a number of area and representation, including uh, alternative dispute resolution. But not all law school must do this. In fact, I understand there are three law schools where experiential learning is not available. So this needs to change because one of the concerns that, uh, speaking from uh, my experience, we have a serious problem with the graying of the bar. Let me give you some numbers here. And these are numbers uh, that I thank the Law Society for having provided me. In Southwest Ontario, we currently, or as of last fall, had 2,008 lawyers. Out of those 2,008 lawyers, 288 of them were over the age of 65. Obviously, Freedom 55 is not available to... <laughs> <laughs> but all kidding aside, if you look at the next slice, from the age 50 to 64, we have 783 lawyers. 
which leaves 937 under the age of 50. When you look at the numbers that way and, and you see where more than 53% of the currently practicing population of lawyer is over the age of 50, what will that look like five years from now, 10 years from now, if there's still some of those are still practicing, um, it's pretty scary because what you're going to start having is a very large unmet demand for legal services. And whenever you have a demand that is unmet, something else will meet it. And it may not be what should, the way it should be met. The, if you look at law students, there's a great process uh, for uh, finding articling position with large firm. You've got the OCI that is set up. But there is not the same process for, for students to find position in the smaller regional center. And, and there's reason for that, obviously. A small firm doesn't have the same structure in place to go through an interview process to attract the students. But this is an area where I think the law schools could be doing a better job because those numbers I've, I've given you for the Southwest are not much different for the Central South, for Northeast, Northwest. Mm -hmm. Basically, only in Toronto do they differ uh, are, are, they, are they quite different? So there are opportunity there. What does it look like? Um, I'm not sure. The Law Society used to have a Beyond Articling event, but it, it was at great expense where uh, all the students were partner, uh, were, were bused to Toronto and would have the opportunity to meet lawyers. However, that's inefficient. The lawyers who would come from out of town had to travel, and perhaps the use of technology with that, there are new solutions. The Ontario Bar Association recently launched something called Find a Lawyer website. And this is an, an innovation I brought in because I thought what this is a concrete st uh, step to bring access to justice because it's the only website tool where you can find a lawyer using a parameter of language, any language. And if you can't find somebody who un understands you, how can you have access to justice? Well, maybe that same kind of technology can be used by the law school to create Find a Student maybe more ed education or information could be available to students to educate them of the benefits or the alternatives of practicing in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to skip over it just quickly. We'll mix things up a little bit. We'll sure. turn over to Mike Lerner. I asked uh, Erica if I could go next because I'm under the green of the bar and, and the bus <laughs> from the nursing home is supposed to pick me up at 330. And if I miss that bus, I have nowhere to go. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, he's one of our young men. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, I'm just going to comment on a couple of things that I've heard because I think it's maybe more useful. Uh, and in response to Chris, the fact that uh, the faculty in the law school has uh, uh, allowed me to come in next January to teach a semester uh, program on access to justice, I think is the first step uh, towards this university law school uh, being a center of excellence. Uh, the second thing that I think I'd like to, to comment on, I think the law schools in this province have to redefine themselves. Uh, they are no longer just the academy. They have to take an active part in the necessity of experiential learning. And I, I think I'm, it's, I'm, uh, it's fair to say that I still believe there's a, a, a distinction within the faculty of those who think this law school is simply uh, uh, a place to pursue academic pursuits, and another element that thinks that this is a place where experiential learning uh, should form an important and integral part. Uh, I think to that extent the law societies have to redefine themselves and move uh, into the current situation. Uh, I also think that, uh, that uh, Fred has hit right on the point, and that is who is this system for? And I think if we always keep that in mind, uh, uh, I think that we can improve the system. I can give you a number of examples that would cost absolutely nothing to improve access to justice. And I'm going to start with the court offices in our court buildings, where people come in off the street and ask people in the criminal court office or the civil court offices for assistance, and the answer they get is, I can't give legal advice. That's baloney. Nobody wants legal advice. They want some direction and some guidance. And the Attorney General of this province can designate a person in each one of the registrar's office as the communication person to whom those people who are seeking some guidance at the very basic elementary stage 
can go to to find out where to go and how to go about it so that they're not walking out of the courthouse more frustrated with the system than when they walked in. There's all kinds of examples like that. But there's, a, a, there's an example, costs nothing, but let's see if it gets implemented. Thank you, Mike. Back to you, Margaret. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to um, just uh, dovetail on a couple of uh, my uh, panelists' uh, remarks about experiential learning. I've been here at Western Law for over 10 years. Prior to that, I spent my career at a community clinic in Sarnia. So I've been working in legal aid work for my whole career. But something that I've noticed in the last 10 years anyways, more and more middle class folks that cannot receive legal aid assistance from one way or the other, um, but are, cannot access the system and are trying to navigate the system on their own. Um, Thankfully, J Doug Ferguson and I have also been uh, able to be the head of the Pro Bono Students Canada program here at Western Law and have tried to fill in some of those gaps. I'll give you a couple of examples. We get a lot of calls here for people who want to navigate the small claims court system. They don't qualify for our services, but they don't have money to, to access a lawyer. So in response to that, we used what I consider to be the best resource to solve the problem of access to justice, law students, to create teams uh, to help people run a clinic down, down at the public library uh, to assist people with the, um, the forms and the procedures so they can navigate it better and on their own. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is we are, we are not tapping in sufficiently in my mind to the resource known as law students. One thing that I've noticed since I've been here is from day one, they want to contribute to the betterment of our system. And um, at places like Western Law, where there are lots of uh, in-house opportunities and through Pro Bono, some externships as well, and some people in the crowd here today um, mentor our students out in the community, that those students are in some ways the conduit to, to uh, allowing people to access the system that which they can't otherwise. Uh, Pascal and I do live in the same area. Unfortunately, Sarnia doesn't have the resources of this school. Um, so I know there's lots of people at the Sarnia Courthouse wandering around, not getting assistance with their criminal case, not getting assistance with their family law case. Whereas if you're lucky enough to live in one of the six areas where there is a student legal clinic or student legal program, legal assistance program, you get more access. So to that end, um, how does this fit into the law school education? I believe that uh, this law school and the others in the province should have a required experiential learner, learning requirement that's set out, uh, that meets certain criteria. That way you can engage more students and they can get credit for uh, the work that they do. And who knows, someday we might even have an in-house LPP program here where their long hours of work uh, uh, could work towards uh, some time of some form of recognition for their articling year. Yeah, so I want to pick up on where Margaret left off because um, she's fully aware of the fact that I agree with her completely. Um, <laughs> law students absolutely are an untapped resource when it comes to meeting gaps in the justice system. There's no question that the law schools, particularly over the past few years, um, are exposing greater and greater numbers of students to the realities of the access to justice crisis. Um, programs like Pro Bono Students Canada, which operates in 21 law schools across the country, clinical programs like the clinic that Doug and Margaret run, experiential courses, I mean, these are the things that are providing students with the opportunity to get out of the classroom and into the community to provide legal assistance. Um, I want to mention that another value uh, that I think is important to note about um, you know, in addition to sort of the concrete and measurable, as Fred talked about, we want to measure the impact that we're having on the community, but another sort of more difficult to measure value that the students are providing by doing this work in the community is they're offering dignity and compassion to low-income people who are at a very difficult time in their lives and need some support and some assistance in navigating the system. And I think that that's really, um, uh, really an important thing to consider. I also want to talk about the impact that these programs have on the culture and the future of the profession. Because I think it's really important to note that by exposing law students to the value of pro bono service and community service and public service, mm -hmm. 
by exposing them to the realities of the access to justice crisis. And I think it's critical that we do things like offer access to justice courses, have panels mm -hmm. in the law school on access to justice. What we're doing is we're creating a generation of law students who are more inclined to understand that pro bono and community service is part of their professional obligation as lawyers and to make it a part of their everyday practice when they graduate. So this is really having a systemic impact. I think the fact that law firms are increasingly providing organized pro bono opportunities to students and associates is a reflection of the fact that they recognize that there's a business case and a recruitment and marketing imperative for them uh, in terms of uh, being able to recruit the best and the brightest. So that's the kind of uh, uh, shift that I think these programs are having on the profession in terms of shifting professional values. Um, there's in, this increasing awareness that access to justice is, a, is not accessible to all Canadians. There's a trend by law schools toward more experiential learning. <coughs> One would think that this is the perfect confluence of uh, uh, issues that is going to make um, the law schools more open and receptive to uh, working with, with uh, communities to deliver legal services to low-income Canadians. However, so I want to just sound a note of caution. Um, if we really want to harness the passions and the intelligence and the commitments and the skills of law students, I think we have to recognize that there are going to be a couple of challenges. You can see I'm whipping through my notes because I got the memo that we were supposed to be provocative, but it's a little bit longer than it was supposed to be. Um, but let me, let me tell you what I think the three major challenges, and we can maybe elaborate this a little bit further in the discussion, are going to be to uh, our desire, and I think all of us in this room would agree, um, that we need to leverage law students to help make the justice system more accessible. The first challenge is going to be incorporating access to justice goals into the academic priorities of the law schools. We may see the law schools as stakeholders in this access to justice conversation, but query whether all of the law schools see themselves as stakeholders in the conversation. There's no question that some of them do, um, but there is a, it's a mixed bag out there in terms of, I think, the commitment to dealing with these issues at a level of legal education. And so that's going to be a challenge. It's going to be bringing the law schools into this conversation and making them, um, working in partnership with them, and they're going to have to want to do that. The second challenge is going to be designing student-appropriate access to justice placements. Law students can do a lot. I work with absolutely tremendously talented uh, law schools. Our, our program recruits 1,600 of them a year to work in the community on access to justice projects, but they can't do everything. They can't, for example, deliver legal advice. Um, so we have to think carefully about how they can best meet the gaps. What are the greatest needs in civil law right now, and how can law students, um, how can we design programs that best meet those gaps? And the third challenge, and this might be the greatest challenge of, of them all, is going to be securing the resources needed to supervise, to design these programs and to supervise and run them. Students need to be rigorously trained, the projects need to be carefully designed, and students need to be supervised. And all of that takes resources. My organization, Pro Bono Students Canada, each year in the last three years has turned away 700 law students a year who have wanted placements in our program, but we simply don't have the capacity to develop more and run more than we're already doing. Over the next three years, our main funder is the Law Foundation of Ontario. We're in a low interest rate environment. We have been for many years. We continue to be for the foreseeable future. We're facing a $400,000 shortfall over three years. So every dollar that we fundraise right now, and we're working very hard to do that, is going into maintaining the status quo. You can't build and grow your program when you're just scrambling to you know, maintain uh, the baseline. So I think resources is an issue. And then the last thought I will leave you with is something that has been bothering me for quite a while, which is that this trend toward experiential learning in the law schools, while I applaud it and I think it's excellent, my concern is that more and more the law schools see the need to provide remunerated opportunities by students. And by that I mean four credit experiential learning opportunities. Our organization is a pro bono organization. Our philosophy is that we want to attract students to do this work on a volunteer basis, that there's something very inherently valuable about having students do this work on a volunteer basis as opposed to for credit. There's nothing wrong with also doing the work for credit. I did it as a law student. Um, it's an excellent opportunity to get practice-based school skills and earn your degree. 
But at the end of the day, is this scrambling toward developing these experiential learning opportunities on a four-credit basis? Are we sacrificing something um, by promoting these as being sort of the most attractive opportunities for students? So I, um, that's a question that I have that I'd be interested in people's thoughts. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm president of Legal Aid Ontario, and I have a great privilege of working with many, many people uh, relative to the improvement of social justice in Ontario. We work with 77 fabulous clinics who are doing their best to provide service to an ever larger community at ever challenging rate of funds. We have 4,000 lawyers in the private sector who are doing tremendous work, again, with challenges relative to funding, court processes, and the variables that affect timing and circumstance in the legal system. We also have our own lawyers who do their very best, duty counsel, staff lawyers, and others in Legal Aid Ontario, who are working a great deal uh, with the private sector and on their own to provide a variety of services to our clients who are increasingly demanding more and more and different kinds of services from the public funder. The challenge, I think, for us, and I think I would like to uh, comment a little bit on the OBA and, and CBA study, which I think has nailed it right on the head, actually, is that we have to be very, very clear about who all these people and others are serving. I'll give you some statistics. The vast majority of criminal certificates that we issue uh, are issued to clients who are aged 18 to 35. Majority, 81%, are male. Approximately 60% of family law clients are 18 to 35 as well. Persons under 35 of eight years of age consistently represent over 60% of LAO's certificate clients. What do these people have in common? Well, they're young. And I think we have to come to grips with the fact the young people today have a very different way of looking at systems and processes than perhaps some of us who are just like me, just marginally over 35. <laughs> what is the culture of young Canadians, young Ontarians these days? There's probably many different uh, answers and different concepts of this, but I think we would have to take a look at how our economy and our society is working. What are the principal drivers of it in terms of its characteristics? Speed. There's no patience with things that are slow by young people. They do not get it, they do not understand it, and they cannot for the life of them figure out why any system would be built to be slow. Clarity. They want certainty. They want to understand the dynamic they're in. They want to get answers and move on to the next issue that they've got. They want things that are cost effective. They're actually very frugal, most of them. And they work very hard to conserve their money because they're paying off law school loans and want to save for a mortgage and so forth, like people elsewhere are. And they insist on having systems that are client focused. They insist on being the center of that particular minor universe, which is the customer dynamic. Well, what do these characteristics have in common with our justice system? My sense is that there's a gap, to, be, to put it in an understated fashion. We're going to have to recognize that what law schools have, I think, most to offer, they have a body of people who are, in fact, very much the future, and the future is being played out today. Law schools can not only teach young people, they can learn. And law schools can take that learning and move it into the systems that we and the, and the law society and other law schools and other legal actors work in. We have to figure out how to connect with these young people, PDQ. They will not tolerate the lingering kind of doubt, the complicated, imprecise, long processes demand. We're going to have to find, I think, a way to integrate their characteristics into our system. No longer are we going to be able to say, this is the system, you must fit into it. And think of that for a moment. 
what will that do? It will change the system for sure. It will import a culture that is in fact predominantly oriented not to speed, not to clarity, and not to client focused. We're going to have to find some answers for this. Happily, there exists, I think, a little paradigm that we can use to address the question. I was very fortunate to work uh, uh, in conjunction with the Ministry of the Attorney General when Justice on Target, uh, led by Minister Bentley, was launched. I can say this now, Chris, because you're not running, but it was one of the more in important dynamics that we have seen in the justice system. It brought together concepts that are not foreign to young people in our society. It brought together some interesting properties, I think, that are worth mentioning. It tried to measure things. It used technology. It insisted on accountability. And it demanded leadership from all the actors in the justice system. Its effects are still being felt, and will be, I think, for a very long period of time, in terms of developing a more coherent, clear, <coughs> clearly oriented, and speedy process than we have seen before. This was not easy as a participant in the process. I can assure you that all actors maintained their independence and wanted to ensure that absolutely nothing would affect them day to day. <laughs> and in fact, the dynamic of collaboration, which was one of its principles, has in fact replaced some of that independence. My sense this, in this respect is that we have some hope. There is leadership. There is experience in doing this in trying to be relevant to the community we serve. We have to build on it a little more. And I think actors like myself and others here represented are going to have to take a tip from Doug and his very excellent uh, uh, Congress here today in saying, not to what, what do others have to do, but what do I have to do? What do the institutions that I represent have to do? In Legal Aid Ontario, we've been working on this. We are far from perfect. We have made some progress in terms of technology. We have hundreds of thousands of clients now accessing us by the internet and by uh, phone services. We're tailoring services to the need. We're not everyone gets a certificate because not everyone needs one. A lot of people get certificates because they need one. And if they do, they get it if they're qualified. We're finding ways to address the client where they live and not working it the other way around, which I think is the challenge that the justice system needs to accept. We have a long way to go, but we are putting into place the foundations for progress. We've recently uh, had three years of balanced operational budgets. Our financial house is in order. Our debt is uh, virtually eliminated. We're serving more clients than before. And we have an array of tools that our people and our private sector partners in the, in the law profession can use. This is the shape of legal aid in the future. It will work where the clients are. It will bend itself to serve the client need. We will find ways to invent new processes and new tools to ensure that the customers that we have, that you have, find a way to serve it in a culturally appropriate way. And by that, I mean technology and all that goes with it. It's going to be a long haul for us and I suspect for the other actors in the system. But the demands that young people are putting on the system require us to make a leap. If we take a look at technology for a moment. Bob, sorry, can I get you to wrap one up second. quickly? Eighty years ago, television was invented. It's still not in the courts. How can a system like that be relevant to young people who are tweeting Facebooking, and everything else. We have to find a way to move technology to suit the culture of our client. Thank you very much. I don't have a question or, uh, or a comment. Um, you know, as a long time ago uh, law student, uh, you know, I, I can... You know, I can say that the, that the, the joys of practice, but I'm a small town practitioner from Thameslow, just 
40 minutes to Sarnia people will, uh, will know where I'm from. The rest of you, I'll give directions to if you really want to know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I just, there's no better time uh, to be practicing you know, in the venue that we've been talking about than right now. Uh, you know, the, the doom and gloom of the, of the state of the legal system, in my view, just doesn't exist. You know, all the things we've been talking about, I do. And uh, the tools that are available for, for effective solutions to problems are just endless. Uh, the, rule, the court rules allow for it, the, the processes allow for it. In technology, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the reach for uh, research facilities is just unparalleled. It's, just, it's, it's great. <coughs> um, so there's no better time now, so if you're a student, all I can say is compared to a long time ago, when I was a law student, it, it, it's just a marvelous, marvelous time. You know, just for the students, you're talking about this whole thing in the context of the law, of the, uh, of the law school and what they can do. The challenge, uh, in my view, for the law schools is how do you keep the fire in the belly, you know, after you leave here? So you have the, you can get the students, when they're here in law school, and I did this, you know, in Ottawa, when a very active student legal aid society, and now that's where I cut my teeth practice, and it was great. And I still worked on that, and I can say, but the problem and challenge is, how do you keep the fire in the belly after the students, and I guess we'll talk to you, how do you keep the fire in the belly after you leave here? Because the, the, the hard reality of it is that once you leave here, you call the bar, you, know, you get hammered by the law society in all kinds of ways. No disrespect. Uh, <laughs> um, let me list the ways if you got time. By the way, you've got, you've got this, this nasty law society floating up there with endless fees, audits, complaints people, endless bureaucracy. Uh, you know, you've got legal aid, quite frankly, that just is not there. There's, not there to, there's just no money to be made out of legal aid. Um, my, my wife is on your exceptions committee, so I've heard the stories. Um, so, you know, there, and, and nobody cares. You know, quite frankly, you're on your own, you've got to make your own way in this world. How do you do it? Um, and quite frankly, it's a choice between doing what I do and maybe becoming in-house counsel for Air Canada. I mean, I think for a lot of people it becomes kind of a no-brainer. but. To do the things that we've been talking about are important, but the challenge, again, in the law schools, is how do you get, keep that excitement going? <coughs> and it is exciting to do this stuff. It really and truly is. It's great to get up every morning and go and just see what else I can do, either to comfort the afflict, afflicted or afflict the comfortable. What you know, we both. But how do you do it? There's, I think that is the challenge, and that is the real question. The answer is join the OBACBA. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody want to respond? Can I pick up on one theme, just very briefly? The, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, about the law school experience is, with some exceptions, it tends to be an individual experience. You start in September and you write the exam or do the paper by December. Most of it you're doing on your own, unless you're in a voluntary group or. Maybe there's the odd collaborative exercise. Outside of law school, most of life involves a lot of other people. Even if you're a, you know, a sole criminal law practitioner, you know, when I see some of my colleagues, Chris Dobson here, and, and you're going to be working with experts, whether they're medical experts, whether they're toxicology experts, you're going to be working with professionals in, in forensics and others. You, deal with the Crown and the police all the time. It's, it, it's working with other people, whether they're on your team or not, in achieving an ultimate result. And you know, law school is a great place to start that because it's a heck of a lesson to have to learn as you're in the middle of a very challenging and difficult trial. So there's, and by doing that, by learning to be more collaborative, the CBA, the OBA, other associations. I think you're also encouraged to work with your colleagues uh, in areas or in venues that aren't directly related to your cases and keep in touch and contact uh, with your colleagues, which can be supportive later on. It's that indirect mentoring uh, 
idea. But it's a great point. I think Margaret, you just had a quick response as well. Yeah. Tom, I think that from my experience, uh, the students that are involved in um, hands-on work while they're in law school, whether it's in a clinic or a pro bono course or, or sorry, pro bono experience or a placement outside an externship, they tend to be the ones that keep the fire. Because when you have them in law school, uh, whether it's they're doing it voluntarily or for credit, they see the direct impact of their work very quickly. And those that do not take advantage of that or are not asked to take advantage of that, they kind of slide through for three years and the, it's never there. So to me, the answer is to engage them in a realistic way, not just in class, but hands on. Um, I, I think there is, a, when you, once students graduate, I, I do think there's a direct relationship between the desire to do this kind of work and an opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. So increasingly in Canada, there are organized, for example, in the pro bono community, organized pro bono opportunities. Mm -hmm. PBSC, my organization was started in 1996, Pro Bono Law Ontario in 2001. Today there are five provincial pro bono clearinghouses that create opportunities for the bar to get involved in a systemic and organized way in access to justice initiatives. In the absence of those kinds of programs, I think it's very difficult because you just get caught up in the day-to-day -day and bread and butter of your practice mm -hmm. and there's nothing, there's nowhere for you to go to sort of fulfill that dream that you had in law school of making the world a better place. So I do think that these kinds of organizations and increasingly we're moving toward um, uh, this model in Canada are really important, not only in terms of getting law students engaged, but then getting the bar engaged um, throughout the course of their careers. I, I think people, this whole access to justice issue is like throwing a stone into the ocean. <clears throat> I mean, the problem is so significant now that you can't measure how much water is going to be displaced by this, uh, the, uh, the stone. So metrics are going to be very difficult. And, and, and some metrics, uh, I question whether or not they're meaningful. But let me suggest to you, I was really impressed with the facilities that you have upstairs. And there was only one problem with them. They shouldn't be there. They should be downtown. That's where these people, there are people in this community that will never come to the university clinic because it's the university. They, they're intimidated by everything that happens up here. And, and if it, half, the clinic should be half the size, and the other half should be downtown someplace where people who can't get around by car, may not have bus fare, uh, will be able to walk to access justice. I like to think of things in simple terms. My suggestion with regard to the courthouse is the registrar's office. It's a simple term to me. Uh, instead of go, having the people who need this service come here, it should be going to them. So I, I think it's a terrific facility. Uh, I'm very impressed by it, but I couldn't help but thinking as I was walking around, half of this uh, facility shouldn't even be here. If I might, yeah. we... Uh... <laughs> now you know what it feels like to be the treasurer. Yeah! <laughs> I agree with you 100%, Mr. Lerner. This is one of the worst places for people, a lot of the clients that we service, to, to come to. But our students have to have somewhere to work and to work well. Uh, the, those, of, those of you that had the pleasure of seeing the previous version of our clinic um, know that there wasn't a lot of room to work. But nevertheless, we have at least four or five outreach clinics and some of the students, previous students that are now called to the bar were instrumental in sending up the one at the London Public Library, which is like a hub for justice there. So just to, to make that clear. Um, quickly. Many of the people I have talked to who would like to ha have a uh, social justice uh, career are very much burdened with student debt uh, and they make other choices as a result of it. We have to do something about that. And it's, uh, if we're going to have people who work in this kind of uh, uh, environment, in this business, uh, they'll never be rich, but I think they do have to have some opportunity not to be burdened with the kind of debt that it, it, it takes now to move through uh, law school. And if there is that opportunity, they will still have the fire and the passion right now it's just not realistic for them economically in many cases I think we have to correct that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, go ahead in the back there. 
Yep, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make two observations. Uh, one has uh, the story. Uh, the, I was involved in a social research and planning council where I live. They did a report on the violence against women. And it was a, a lengthy report and lots of great information. And uh, we found out that people were really excited about the counseling services the community provided for people who had no home and no money. But when you ask the people what you provide their report to, what do they really want? They didn't really want the counseling so much as some money in the home. So the point I make is it's fine for us to sit around and talk about access to justice and all these great things, models we're going to design and how we're going to fix the problem. But like Mr. Ward pointed out, you've got to go to the source of the person that needs the service to determine what it is they need qualitative somehow. So we can't design that without their direct participation. And then dovetailing with that, I don't think, I think technology <coughs> is great. It's not a panacea. Uh, I work in a legal clinic. A lot of our clients don't have phones. Or they have phones that they never have enough time to make a phone call. They get a phone for, I don't know what kind of plan they got the phone, and we can only text them at certain times of the day. So they are using, circuitously using technology, but they don't have access to technology the way most of us understand it. Or you might think young people who've got video screens on the back seat when they're driving anywhere with their parents, that's great, but that's not our, our clients. And our clients in a legal clinic, huge access to justice issues. And one other observation I'll make, uh, and Margaret, I've been to your clinic a couple of times and talked about what you're doing with, uh, with the consumer protection stuff. I think that's a huge burgeoning area. And I think if you want to hook up with the middle class, there is your juggler there. Okay? There's your, and they want fire in the belly? Who hasn't got a cell phone contract? Who hasn't, who hasn't said? Ethan Rogers, Ethan Tellis? You haven't said that, you haven't lived. I would lived. Know. <laughs> Who, incidentally, back to the technology issue, don't, don't go the route where, yes, our call is important to you. Because they clearly, the last time I got one of those calls, they said, thank you so much for politely pretending to give a shit. I know you did. <laughs> not paid enough to care, so we don't want to. So I think technology, we, we need to learn it and use it and exploit it. But we need to first and foremost be directly connected to the people who need the service and figure out what exactly they need. I would say that technology uh, does not replace the direct connection when the direct connection um, is essential or when people don't have access <coughs> to technology. Unfortunately, injustice. The conversation that we tend to have is, well, is everybody connected up with technology and can everybody use it? And if absolutely everybody can, we're not going to have any of them. And that's not the way anybody in this room lives. Nobody else lives that way. Nobody. I'll bet you all have at least one, maybe two, phones or devices on which you do more than take calls. Well, don't assume that everybody, because they aren't here, don't do some of that or have access to some. And you know, we can be a lot of places. I had an office. I had a law office for many, many years. I had people drive in out of town. Gosh, when I think about that now, if I could have done half of those conversations through some computer screen that somebody else would show me how to use, it would have been a lot better for them. Same time for me. But they don't have to come. When we have to get together and have the conversation, you can have it. I think the issue with technology is not it's an all or nothing deal. It's just that we're not using anything. Simple example on access to justice, and then I'll be quiet Goes somebody else. So you're doing a civil or, or criminal or family pretrial in London, Ontario. And the lawyers from Toronto and, the, and, and maybe the crown is from out of town, uh, from Sarnia. So what's the, what's the de facto rule right now with the very rare exception? Well, lawyer from Toronto comes in, lawyer from Sarnia comes in. How long does the pretrial take? Half an hour on a good day? You think of the cost in a civil or family case for driving from Toronto to here, from Sarnia to here, waiting around, and then going back. I mean, that's thousands of dollars, potentially. Not only that's borne by the client or clients, but that's delay for every other client they have because they're not using the time for somebody else. And how even I, 
and that is a very, very low bar, <laughs> can use this and have a conversation. I did it with England the other day. It's not hard. So why don't we make that the rule and the in-person the exception? You do a few things like that, gosh, you start reducing the, you start reducing the cost immediately. And just, That's access. Just this for, will be the last word. For, <laughs> for, for, for Chris. And what does it cost, Chris? It costs nothing. It saves money. So there's all kinds of these initiatives, uh, like what Chris has suggested, that is, uh, you know people can think of. And you know, who does it, who does it fall upon? Well, it may fall upon Justice Leroy to say, I'm not going to force people who have in that situation. I'm prepared. Somebody has to take responsibility and, and, and do it because we can't wait for somebody to change the rules, especially on these changes that cost nothing. And what they really do is save clients money. I hate to tell you that there's a judge in the region who compelled me to appear in court for, and I timed it, for two minutes and 20 seconds. I had to drive one hour up and one hour back, and I had to re an agent attend but the judge insisted it be a personal attendant. That's nuts. Who, who's this system for? Can we just say for the record it wasn't me? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <nice. laughs> Thank you. Well, in the interest of getting you to your refreshment break, I'm going to finish here. I ha uh, obviously, there's a lot more to discuss, and you can, you're welcome to do that. I should say just on behalf of legal educators, this is a really exciting time for us here at the law school between changes to the licensing process and uh, access to justice initiatives that are going on and just best educational practice in, in general. What's, what's the best training for our student? What is the best way to educate them so they can hit the ground running when they enter uh, practice? It's a really exciting time and I'm really grateful for all your uh, feedback and thoughts on that. Thank you. That's great.